All right, how's it going, y'all? Today, we're going to be installing a dual 10 gigabit SFP Plus card in this DS1621 Plus that Synology sent over. Synology sent over both these things as well as some hard drives. However, I do have to send them back and this is entirely me making my own videos. Synology had no input into these videos. All right, so when you're going 10 gigabit, you actually have really two common standards that people adhere to. Most people, when you have a one gigabit connection, it's almost certainly going to be a regular copper one gigabit RJ45 cable that you can stick a Cat6 or Cat5 cable into and it will just work. However, once you go 10 gig and faster speeds, it starts becoming more and more common to use fiber or DAC cables, which is direct attached copper cables, which adhere to the SFP plus standard. And so because of the very fast speeds that are involved with 10 gigabit, it actually is really hard to do signal processing on copper cables because over long runs, there's a lot of signal degradation. And so that's why optical becomes so much more common. And for optical, you use this SFP plus connection. And so for this, I asked Synology to send the dual SFP plus card because my switch uses SFP plus primarily because it is so much easier to use and it's much more common in networking gear. And so I'm just gonna go ahead and open it up and we'll check it out. And so the card obviously comes in an ESD bag and it actually comes with two different options a full width bracket or the pre-installed half width bracket, which is used on Synology NASes and honestly most rack servers and most servers. And so unfortunately, I know this is picking. I really wish they would include like a black option because their entire case is black and then there's this white thing that sticks out. It's not the biggest deal, but it's just like, eh, you could just have everything be the same color. That's an OCD thing though. And so yeah, right here is the card. It has two SFP plus connections on there which is a much larger module. So this is a DAC cable. So you basically just slot it in there and it latches. Then they always come with a little puller that you use to unlock it. And so it's a much different module. So normally when you're dealing with fiber, you would actually have a optical transceiver here that actually converts this electrical signal into light. And then that light is what you plug a special optical cable into, which basically just bends the light with very little loss over a very long distance. You can, for very cheap, get an optical transceiver that will go four kilometers. It is so easy for long standards and very, very, very fast transmission rates. All right, and so now let's go ahead and install it on this DS1621 Plus. And so to do that, there are six screws in the back here that you've got to remove. And then once you remove those six screws, you simply slot the entire case backwards and that unlocks it and then you just pull it straight up. Be careful not to bend the case. So then we've got this PCIe slot right here and that's what we're gonna slot into. First off, you need to remove the screw right here that is used to lock in the PCIe. And be careful, it is a very similar looking but different screw. So keep it separate from the six from the case and then simply just pull up on this tab right here and the built-in cover should come off. Now you're basically going to want to slot in the card by basically first putting the tip in so that it lines back up over here and then just set the card in. And then once everything's lined up, you would simply put some force on the very top of the card to push it in. And so now it should be slotted in. Now simply put the cover back down, use that screw to retighten it and your card should be secure in there. If you want, you can keep this cover, but if you're just always gonna have the card in there, you can throw it away if you want to. And now you're done. Now we just need to go ahead and put the cover back on. To put the cover back on, you simply slot it on and push it forward. It can be a bit of a pain in the butt. I found that keeping it as close to the front as possible makes it a lot easier. There are basically two nubs in here that are used for lining up and locking in. But once you've got that lined up, you simply push it in and reattach the screws. And then you can go ahead and boot the thing back up and we'll go ahead and finish this video in DSM and check out those two ports. All right, and so now I've just plugged in two SFP plus cables into that and I've also booted up the NAS. I will say one thing. 
I did find that the very first time you set up the NAS, you actually have to be using the built-in gigabit connection or if it's got a 10 gigabit, but it's gotta be the built-in connections. DSM will not start up for the very first time on a PCIe card, at least as far as I was able to get it to do. So I did have to plug in a one gigabit cable into the RJ45 jack on the back, but that's not a big deal. Once you've set up the card, it's just plug and play and you can just unplug any of the other gigabit connections on the back. And you actually really should do that. You should not have basically two IP addresses on the same network going to the same device unless there's a very special configuration. If you do that, and especially if there are two different speeds, you can start to get some destination mismatches where you actually are sending packets you think to the 10 gigabit IP address, but it doesn't work that way. And so sometimes you could actually end up sending stuff to the 10 gigabit IP address that ends up on the one gigabit interface. That's because all of computers and all of networking is really designed around the fact that, okay, there's just one IP address per device. And so if you've got multiple, it can get confused. And so really I would not recommend plug in a lower speed connection unless it's going to be on a different subnet. All right, and so now let's go ahead and open up DSM and we're gonna go into control panel. And so I'm gonna go into network. All right, and so as you can see right here, we have both of the 10 gigabit interfaces connected and they've both been given self-assigned IP addresses. This is just for temporary setup. Don't worry, you would actually set this up. And so you can either do link aggregation with this and link aggregation is incredibly easy. You just click create bond and I've got another video on this that's actually much better and I'll go over this, but we can actually just go ahead and create a quick link aggregation here. And I'll use a manual configuration once again, I'm blowing through this just because I've already covered it in another video. And so I'm just going to go ahead and set this up really quickly. And I'm going to set up on my router. And so, yeah, just like that, I know I blew through that, but I'll go ahead and leave my video on link aggregation in the description below. But basically we set up link aggregation on these two 10 gigabit cables. And I could do a video showing, hey, yeah, we've got getting over gigabit speeds, but I only have three mechanical hard drives in this thing right now. And so quite frankly, we're going to get about 600 megabytes read and write per second. Now that's pretty fast. Those are pretty fast drives for hard drives, but they're not going to get anywhere near saturating two 10 gigabit connections. I am planning on doing a video where I'm trying to use the NVMe cache, really trying to see if I can saturate two link aggregated 10 gigabit connections on Synology, but that's going to be a very different video because that's not going to be on the hardware. Really, it's going to be on what is in the NAS rather than what the NAS can actually do. And if you've got like 12 bays, you're easily going to be able to saturate two 10 gigabit connections. From clients I've worked with, I have seen people be able to saturate three different 10 gigabit connections all at the exact same time with video editors running. And we actually ran Blackmagic speed test on three different NICs. And so that's really fast. And so these cards are capable of it and these NAS are capable of it, the higher ones at least. So really what it is going to come down to, if you are enabling jumbo frames, what it's going to come down to is the bottleneck is actually going to be your spinning disks most likely. Now, if I can't get it with spinning disks and NVMe cache, I'm definitely gonna to have to go to making something like a SSD volume to really get it there, but that's really a whole different video. For this, I'm just gonna go ahead and connect to it really quickly and show that it does in fact work and that we will be getting above those speeds. And so I'll just go ahead and open up Blackmagic speed test. Just like that, with three disks. Now this is partially RAM, so as you saw, it kind of spiked there and then came back down. That was because it was first writing to RAM and so it was like, yeah, keep it coming and keep it coming. And then the RAM filled up really quickly because, well, there's just not that much RAM. So we're going to be getting a pretty native, I'd say 600 read and write for this, which is really good for three spinning disks, but this is a RAID zero configuration. It was not even close to being able to saturate one, let alone two link aggregated 10 gigabit connections. So really this is only going to be good for right with this exact setup, something like failover where one of the NICs fails, one of the cables fails, somebody accidentally pulls something out. The entire network doesn't go down. The entire NAS would just switch over automatically to that other one. And that's all shown in that link aggregation video and it works really well. All right, and so now it's all set up. You can go ahead and unplug that one gigabit connection off the back because you no longer need it. And you can just use your NAS with two 10 gigabit connections on there. It's a great setup and it works really easily. Plus SFP plus tends to be a lot cheaper because it does not have to have all that extra denoising because 10 gigabit speeds are so difficult over a long copper cable. 
Instead, SFP Plus will either use optical or very short runs using a DAC cable, meaning you really don't have to pay that super expensive price to be able to run a 10 gigabit ethernet cable over 300 feet. And so because you don't have to do that, SFP Plus is so much cheaper while also being really versatile if you need to move up to higher range things. Though it still does not have that convenience of being able to hire an electrician to throw 10 gigabit cables at your walls because I don't know a lot of electricians who are going to be able to easily set up fiber in your house. I am actually planning on buying a house at one point and trying that out for this, but that's going to be a whole different thing in many months from now. All right, well, that's gonna be it for this video. I'm definitely going to be seeing if I can saturate the two 10 gigabit connections on this DS1621 Plus, but that's gonna be a separate video, so stay tuned for that. All right, go ahead and put any other tutorials you'd like to see me make in the comments below, and have a good one. Bye.